And then probably one of the most fascinating characters of the story is John Wesley Powell. Has anyone heard of this guy? Does anyone know who John Wesley Powell is? No one? You can do like the surveying of like um, Yellowstone or something like that. Yeah, so he was uh, actually not Yellowstone, but um, the Grand Canyon. So um, he was, first of all, he was a Civil War major and he lost his right arm at the Battle of Shiloh. And after the war, he pursued uh, his passion for geology by traveling west um, in the employ of the United States government to map um, some of the last remaining unmapped areas out west. And this include the canyons of the Green and Colorado rivers and most notably the Grand Canyon. And so in 1869, he set out with a crew of nine men in four boats with enough food for 10 months on an expedition to map those canyons. And in fact, if you go to uh, Green River, Utah, uh, which is a tiny little city, they have a museum there dedicated to John Wesley Powell. Um, and they have some of the original boats from this expedition down the uh, Colorado River or the remnants of them. They were beaten up pretty badly. Um, and it's actually a really great little museum. So if you're ever in Green River, uh, Utah, I highly recommend that you stop by the John Wesley Powell Museum. I, I went there not too long ago, but I yeah. did not stop in there. Yeah. So if you ever pass through again, it's definitely worth a stop. Like it, it doesn't seem like much, but once you go in, it's, it's a pretty, uh, it's a really well done exhibition on his life and his work. So um, so anyway, they set out in 1869 to map the canyons and due to the uh, rigors of the trip and the extreme physical danger of boating over vicious rapids and waterfalls, four of the crew quit the expedition and opted to hike out of the canyon, an area that's now known as Separation Canyon. Um, and then three, and this was after a couple of months on the river and it was obviously, you know, extremely dangerous. Um, and it was um, something that some of the men who signed up for the trip were like, this is more than I can take. And so they decided to leave. Unfortunately for them, only three days later, uh, Powell and the remaining crew completed the journey and emerged from the canyon. Unfortunately, the four guys who left the expedition at Separation Canyon were never heard from again. And it's thought that they, they either uh, were dehydrated or starved to death on their attempt to hike out of the canyon. So the remains were never found, they were never heard from again. Um, Powell repeated this trip in 1871 and again in 1872. And these are some of the photos from the second expedition uh, down those rivers. And this is Powell down here in the lower right photo. And Powell actually enjoyed a long career in geology and in heading up um, some of the first organizations that were dedicated to geography and geology in the United States. So he went on to be appointed as the second director of the US Geological Survey, the USGS, which is still around today and which is where you get all those um, topo maps from if you're looking at uh, large areas of land. Um, and of course, the USGS does a lot of work with GIS today as well, which we'll be um, touching on a little bit later in the semester. Uh, he was also the director of the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian Institution and was one of the founders of the National Geographic Society. Um, so he went on to have uh, quite a distinguished career and was was always kind of a passionate advocate for the preservation of the Western landscapes. One of his most important contributions to the field of conservation was a book they published in 1875 on his Western explorations. And in that book, he championed land preservation and conservation. And he believed that the resources of the West, particularly water, of course, um, were too scarce for the large scale settlement and farming of the West. And he estimated that only 2% of the land in the Western United States uh, was farmable. And so he recommended that the, whoops, 
He recommended that the United States uh, to the west of the Mississippi should be divided up based upon watersheds in order to avoid conflicts between states and ensure that water was justly distributed. So this was a map that he had suggested for how the Western states should be divided up. Uh, obviously it looks very different from that Jeffersonian grid uh, that had come earlier. And obviously bears no relationship whatsoever to how the states actually were divided up. They went with the Jeffersonian grid. And, um, and of course there have been all sorts of water rights issues ever since, partly uh, due to the fact that nobody was really thinking about watersheds except for Powell um, at that time. So this is a copy of his proposed map of the, of the Western US. And so what do you think um, happened? Like, why wasn't this plan adopted? When he presented this to Congress and he said, you know, instead of that Jeffersonian grid that's been proposed, let's go with this so that we can divide up the land based on watersheds. It looks really difficult to find property boundaries. Yeah, that could be part of it. So it's, it's definitely not, it doesn't, it doesn't look clean and organized the way that the grid does. What else? What was happening around this time, the mid to late 1800s in terms of Western expansion that might have impacted? Something to do with like the gold rush and like the states. The gold rush was happening? Anything else? Actually has to do with transportation infrastructure. Oh, the Trains. railroads? Yeah, the Transcontinental Railroad uh, was probably the single biggest factor in making sure that that type of land uh, distribution and um, delineation did not happen. Um, so the railroad companies already at that time owned vast tracts of land um, out west. In fact, 183 million acres of land was granted from the United States government to the railroads in exchange for building the railways. And the railroads did not agree with Powell's views on land conservation. Uh, they were more interested in land development and their railroads providing the means for people and goods to get out west to develop the land. And uh, they lobbied Congress hard to reject Powell's recommendations, which Congress did. And instead they went with the Jeffersonian grid, which was obviously much, e much easier for uh, break for parcelization of land and for sale of land, which is really what the railroads were interested in because they owned so much of it. And so the US Congress went along with that. They developed legislation that encouraged pioneer settlement of the West based on agricultural use of land. And politicians based their decisions on a theory by uh, this guy, Cyrus Thomas, um, who was a, um, he was a professor at Southern Illinois University. And he was kind of a quack. Um, he suggested that weather patterns were uh, reacted to agriculture. So that basically by, it was like a build it and the rain will come kind of theory. So his theory was that if you start planting stuff in the ground, it somehow attracts rain to the area and will make that land farmable. And uh, Congress decided to go along with that. He had this famous quote that rain follows the plow. Um, as we know, what areas you decide to farm has nothing to do with weather patterns. Um, but that was his theory and Congress decided to go along with it. And so they decided that uh, water resources would not be an issue out West. And uh, here's some people discussing water rights, a popular Western pastime. Um, but at an 1883 irrigation conference, um, Powell was uh, dismayed about the decision that Congress came to. And he, re he remarked, uh, gentlemen, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights for there is not sufficient water to supply the land. And of course that was right. And, um, and to this day, water rights remain a really important issue in uh, everything having to do with development in the Western US. 
1872, we have the first national park being set aside um, as a result of all of the work and popularization of the idea of conservation by the early conservationists. So Yellowstone National Park was established as a park or pleasure ground for the enjoyment of the people by the act of Congress. Uh, it was the first national park anywhere in the world, and it sparked an international movement to preserve landscapes. Um, Yellowstone was under the control of the Department of the Interior at the time and was followed by several other national monuments, which were under the control of various agencies, including the US Forest Service, the Department of Agriculture, as well as state agencies. And there was no one agency that oversaw the management of all of the national park lands and national monument lands. And that brings us to this character, John Muir, who um, hopefully many of you are, are already somewhat familiar with. Um, he was an extremely important character in this story. He was a Scottish American naturalist and writer whose eloquence on behalf of the forests and waterfalls of the Yosemite Valley profoundly changed the way that Americans uh, thought about their relationship with nature. He was a deeply perceptive observer of the geology of the Yosemite Valley and was the first to propose that the glaciers uh, or that glaciers and glacial, glacial activity had carved out the features of the valley, a theory which at that time was at odds with the notion that the valley had been created by a catastrophic earthquake. Um, and of course, you know, decades later with more scientific research, it was discovered that indeed Muir was right that it was glacial activity that had carved out uh, the valley. Um, and in fact, an active Alpine glacier was discovered below Merced Peak in the park, which helped to prove his theories. And in 1903, Muir was visited by a young President Theodore Roosevelt, um, who was himself an avid naturalist and conservationist, mostly because he liked hunting and he wanted to preserve the lands where uh, the big game resided that he liked to hunt. Um, but he and Muir went for a three-day hike alone um, out in the Yosemite Valley, which even at that time was seen as a really bad idea, um, just in terms of the security of the present. His advisors were livid with this idea, but um, he decided to just go off for a three-day hiking and camping trip with Muir uh, into the Yosemite Valley. And Muir used that opportunity to make an impassioned plea for the protection of the Yosemite Valley and other areas of the United States to be set aside as national parks under the control of a single unifying agency. And apparently he made a pretty convincing argument because by the end of his term, Roosevelt had vastly increased the number of national parks and monuments and had laid the foundation for the establishment of the National Park Service, which came into being uh, in 1916 under the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. Then some other um, conservationists who should be mentioned, particularly in regards to the part of the country that we live in. Um, so this is Minerva Hamilton Hoyt, and she was a passionate advocate for the protection of desert landscapes. And at the time during the early conservation movement, most people weren't really thinking about desert as something that needed to be preserved. They were more concerned with kind of the more picturesque types of landscapes in you know, Yosemite and Yellowstone and that type of thing. And she was the first to argue for the preservation of desert landscapes. Um, in the early 1900s, she was one of several people who were chosen by Frederick Law Olmsted to chair a committee on proposals for new national parks in California. And she authored the commission's report on desert parks and helped usher several proposals through Congress to become national parks or national monuments. So two of the places that she's most closely associated with are Joshua Tree National Park and Death Valley National Park. She wrote the, um, the reports that, that essentially laid the groundwork for the legislation that established those as national parks. 
And then 1905, uh, Theodore Roosevelt appointed uh, this guy, Gifford Pinchot, as the first head of the US Forest Service. And he was very much a conservationist in the vein of some of the other individuals that we've been talking about. And he was also a very pragmatic person um, who is very much interested in the proper management of natural resources. So whereas some of the others called for strict conservation, uh, Pincho believed that natural areas and resources could still benefit humans, but also be maintained in such a way as to minimize or eliminate the damage to the environment. And so for this reason, he sort of marks a turning point in the conservation movement to more of what we think of as the modern environmental movement, where there's a recognition that um, natural resources benefit people and that human society needs to have a way to take advantage of those resources, um, but at the same time that we need a balance between people and nature, um, such that natural resources can become sustainable and beneficial while preserving natural ecologies. And in fact, Pincho was one of the first to uh, heed John Wesley Powell's recommendations for the protection of Western watersheds. Um, and he, he um, tried to do so at least using the lands owned by the federal government and the US Forest Service to delineate and protect uh, a lot of the watersheds out West. But unfortunately, a lot of the damage was already done um, partly because his, um, his efforts to protect those watersheds was hampered by the fact that the states had been divided up that the way they had as a grid system. And it was very hard to get cooperation among the states to protect watersheds that crossed over many different states. Um, and Powell's cries of alarm were largely ignored until the 1920s when we had images like this, the Dust Bowl uh, era when, which was really the greatest environmental catastrophe to ever visit the United States and the North American continent, which resulted in untold suffering associated with pioneer subsistence farms that failed due to insufficient rain. So this was a period of extended drought and um, a lot of the soil had not been properly managed by uh, the farmers at that time. And there was just this uh, surface layer of essentially used up, um, uh, dust essentially and soils that had all of the organic material uh, was gone, all of the nutrients were gone and it was, there was nothing, there were no plants left and there was nothing holding that soil down. And so these giant windstorms would come and create dust storms like the one that you see in this photo. And the Dust Bowl was in many ways the beginning of the realization that places could be negatively impacted by land management decisions that were made hundreds of miles away, and that the ecological interconnectedness of large land areas was something that had to be addressed. And by the way, there is, if you're interested in the Dust Bowl era, there's a great documentary on it by Ken Burns that you can find, uh, it shows periodically on PBS. And it's a really great history of that era and just like the, just the insane amount of suffering uh, that went on and, you know, people having to wear um, bandanas and masks everywhere they went just to avoid breathing in dust, um, children dying from just having too much dust in their lungs, waking up every morning, even with the house sealed up tight, you would wake up every morning to like a half an inch of, of dust covering everything in the house. And it was a pretty miserable time and place to be uh, living in American history, but it's a, it's a really good documentary, <clears throat> not just on that period, but on the land management practices that led to the Dust Bowl. Okay, so let's look at the birth now of landscape ecology, which came out of the conservation and environmental movements. So who were some of those people responsible for early landscape ecology? Um, first, we have <clears throat> Carl the Troll, who introduced landscape ecology as a modern science. Uh, sorry, that's not right, Carl the Troll. Uh, it's Carl Troll, not Carl the Troll. Uh, Carl Troll, that's better. So he was a German scientist who was one of the biogeographers, um, a person who studies wildlife biology as it relates to physical geography. 
who is fascinated and very concerned about the types of environmental fragmentation and degradation that had led to the Dust Bowl. And um, one of the big innovations that his research work introduced was the use of a new technology, um, aerial, widely available aerial photography. And he used aerial photos to give a large scale view of land mosaics that uh, few people before him had seen and which had led to a new understanding of the interrelatedness of landscape patterns, plant communities and ecology. And he was the first to begin to notice that the patterns of land development were impacting um, natural ecologies. And he was the first to coin the term landscape ecology and develop many of the key concepts of the discipline such as scale, hierarchy, spatial distribution, fragmentation and disturbance. Um, Troll was focused primarily on patterns in natural landscapes and despite his <clears throat> research and writings on this topic, his work wasn't really widely known for many decades. And then we fast forward to um, Harvard University in 1984, where wildlife biologist and botanist Richard T.T. T. Foreman began teaching ecology courses in the landscape architecture department at the Graduate School of Design. And he had long been interested in spatial ecological patterns and their impact on wildlife biology. And he began combining his own research with the earlier studies by Carl Troll and his growing understanding of landscape architecture and land planning principles led to some of the first understanding of not just the mosaics that occur in natural landscapes, but also the mosaics that occur in human development and how they intersect with those natural landscapes. And so he, he wrote a series of books that are known now as uh, the underpinnings of the modern study of landscape ecology. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, he was my landscape ecology professor when I was in grad school. So in 1986, Foreman co-authored the first textbook on the topic, which was appropriately titled Landscape Ecology. Uh, and it outlined the key components of the field, which remain the backbone of the discipline to this day. And these include spatial heterogeneity, um, gradient, and we'll be talking about what a lot of these terms mean uh, in later lectures, gradient analysis, disturbance and succession, island biogeography theory, matrices and mosaics, patches and corridors and edges and boundaries. And these were all topics that were covered in that original textbook called Landscape Ecology. In the years that followed that first book, uh, Foreman went on to write countless articles on the topic and co-authored or co-authored half a dozen additional books on landscape ecology. And for his contributions to the field, he's now widely considered the father of landscape ecology. And um, these are some of the other books that he wrote in the subsequent years. Um, so Land Mosaics, The Ecology of Landscapes and Regions, um, Landscape Ecology Principles, that was the forward from that book was what your reading assignment was taken from, uh, from the last class. Towns, Ecology and the Land, Urban Ecology, The Science of Cities, Urban Regions, Ecology and Planning Beyond the City, and then Road Ecology. So he looked at all these different aspects of human development and how they intersect with natural ecological systems and what those implications are for um, protecting those places and for land development patterns. <clears throat> so when Foreman wrote his first book, much of the landscape analysis that was needed to study landscape ecology still came from aerial photos the way that uh, Carl Troll had been studying. Um, in the years since, of course, there's been an explosion of data availability as a result of the rise of remote sensing technology. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some of that technology and how that impacts our understanding of landscape ecology. So most large scale remote sensing today is accomplished through the use of satellites that are in constant earth orbit. 
Um, this technology not only gives us a snapshot of a point in time, but also allows us to track changes over time known as temporal resolution. So it's, that's kind of watching a specific area of land and how it changes throughout time. This is an image that shows some of the various types of satellites that are used for remote sensing and data collection. And there are lots and lots of uh, satellites out there that are collecting information about the Earth. This is, uh, this will load in a second, but this is a website that shows all of the satellites that are currently in Earth orbit. And while it's loading, quick, how many do you think there are? How many satellites in Earth orbit, roughly? 10,000 or so? 100,000. It's in the thousands. It's not quite 10,000 yet. It's actually around three to 4,000 right now. Um, but it's growing rapidly, and actually in the next five to 10 years, it's going to grow exponentially. So this is a live view of all of these satellites that are in Earth orbit right now, uh, which is kind of stunning to think about that there's that much stuff up there. Um, and this is actually a pretty cool um, site here because you can, sorry, it's a little, going a little slow here. Here we go. Let me let it catch up. Scott, what's the name of this site? Uh, this satellite is called uh, Stuff in Space. So it's HTTP colon slash slash stuff in. <laughs> so S-T-U-F-F-I-N dot space. So stuff in dot space. And one of the cool things about this is that it shows, this is live, like it shows the actual locations. Sorry, it's like not reacting very, it's like, being very laggy, probably because I'm showing it in a PowerPoint slide. But you'll notice that as I hover over different satellites, let me let this thing catch up. It'll show the name of that satellite. It shows its orbit around Earth. Let's zoom in a little bit. I'm going to go to a daylight part of the Earth here, if I can find one. Come on, Earth. Boy, sorry, it's not, it's not working very well in the PowerPoint. But anyway, if we zoom in on these satellites, oh, not too far though. Oh my God, this thing's being really wonky right now. If you check it out on your own computer, it, it works a lot better. Actually, I'm gonna try going directly to the website. Let's see if that can work better. It really shows how much space trash there is out there. I'm surprised. Yeah, there's quite a bit. And um, if you wonder how did these things not collide into each other, uh, they do collide into each other sometimes. And in fact, the US, part of the US Space Agency looks at, has a live monitoring system to predict uh, bits of space junk or satellites that may end up uh, crashing into each other. Oh, this is so much better, right? So here we, the satellites, and actually if we zoom out, there are you know, satellites in like very high orbit around the Earth and then satellites in much lower orbit around the Earth. And you can click on them to see what the name of the satellite is, see a depiction of its orbit. You can go up here under groups and you can see groups of satellites. So like if I click on SpaceX here, it will show all of the SpaceX uh, satellites and, and where their orbits are and the names of those satellites. Um, and also if you zoom in, let's zoom in roughly where Colorado is here. If you look closely, you can actually see the satellites moving across the landscape. And so you can see where they're moving in real time. And this is in real time at the actual speeds that they're moving. And to actually give you a better idea of how those move, I'm going to show you a quick Let's close this page here.
Sorry, my internet's going really slow. So this is a pretty cool video that shows, um, these are actually communication satellites for worldwide internet that were launched by SpaceX. What's that? Anyway, um, so this video, once it loads, sorry, my, I, I find Zoom just negatively impacts all <laughs> uh, computer speeds. But anyway, this is a video just watch for a second here. This is, and it's getting laggy. Here we go. So this is a real, um, an actual video in real time of uh, SpaceX satellites that were launched, and they launched them in these giant trains of a couple of hundred satellites. So this is what you actually see, these, this like line of lights just moving across the sky. And this was filmed in Europe. And at the time when these satellites were launched, people were calling the local authorities to report that aliens were invading the earth because they didn't know what the hell this was. Yo, I saw that. Yeah. It's that was so crazy. Did we we all thought it was like something else. Sky? Yeah, we, we had no idea what it was. And it was just like a line of satellites. And we looked it up and we were freaked out at first. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So Elon Musk is basically trying to provide high-speed internet to all corners of the earth so that no matter where you are, you have a connection. And um, so this is part of that um, part of that effort. It's called uh, Spacelink or no, um, wait, what was it called? Starlink, sorry, it's called Starlink. And so his plan is to launch 11,000 of these satellites over the next couple of years to provide worldwide um, high-speed internet coverage. <clears throat> And before you get alarmed and think that the skies are constantly going to be filled with satellites that look like this all the time, they only look like this right after they're launched because they have these giant solar panels on them that are reflective. And when they first go into Earth orbit, they're in low orbit and they're very easy to see. Once they get to their permanent orbit elevation, they're so far away that you can't see them anymore unless you're using a telescope or binoculars or something. So the sky will not be littered with uh, satellite um, reflections like that, but it's just pretty cool to see what those look like when they're launched. All right, back to the lecture. So of course, much of the collected information that we get um, from satellites is readily available through applications like Google Earth, which offers uh, pretty useful uh, functionality and is really kind of a very basic version of GIS um, in terms of locating um, places and objects and systems within a geographic context. And um, you can get uh, Google Earth Pro for free. It's a free license now. And um, it's got a lot of really good resources in it. If you've never explored the layers section of Google Earth, I recommend that you do. They have tons of really good uh, data in there that's, that can be useful for different types of uh, projects that you may work on. Um, one of the more interesting ways that you can use Google Earth is using um, what are known as KML or KMZ overlays. Um, KML stands for Keyhole Markup Language. So Keyhole was the name of Google Earth before Google purchased that company and turned it into Google Earth. Um, so Keyhole Markup Language or Keyhole Markup Zip, which is like a zipped version of that language, um, provides GIS data overlaid on the Google Earth environment. And so for example, this is a map showing soil types in the Washington DC area. So you can overlay these layers of uh, GIS data directly onto Google Earth so you can see how it intersects with uh, the built environment, with development patterns, and, um, and all sorts of other types of factors. So to open something like this in Google Earth, uh, you just download. You can find KML and KMZ files all over the internet. Most of them are freely available. You can download 
a lot of them from um, open data uh, websites. <clears throat> and if you just double click on that file, the computer asks, what do you want to open this with? And you say, I want to open it with Google Earth. And then it just opens it, shows it overlaid directly on the uh, correct geographical extent. <clears throat> and then Google Earth also allows for the viewing of 3D buildings and even trees through a technology that's known as photogrammetry. So this is part of downtown Denver, um, where you get down, you know, uh, 3D buildings, 3D trees, gives you a really good sense of what that uh, 3D environment is. And a lot of that data is collected through what's known as photogrammetry. So photogrammetry uh, uses nothing but photos. It doesn't use, um, you know, any other types of sensing technology. Just it's basically based on drones or airplanes or satellites taking aerial photos from a number of different angles. And all of those angles are basically plugged into a uh, computer program that decodes those different photos and figures out the three-dimensional aspects of the landscape based on taking all these different angled photos of the landscape. And it's able to produce um, pretty good 3D models of landscape areas. Right, so this is an example of the kind of thing that you get from photogrammetry. So it's not, it's a little bit messy, right? You get, you know, the aerial photos kind of smeared over these three-dimensional objects, but it gives you a pretty good sense of um, what some of those three-dimensional objects are in the landscape. And it can be done quickly for large areas of land, which is why this is the technology that's used for uh, Google Earth in terms of generating their 3D imagery for cities and landscapes. For more detailed investigations of three-dimensional um, areas or three-dimensional data, we have LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. Um, and that's essentially a technology where uh, satellites or drones or, um, or airplanes uh, have a LIDAR detection camera, essentially, that collects data that bounces light off of uh, the surface of the earth. And depending on the frequency and the speed at which that light bounces back, they can determine all sorts of properties, um, not just the elevation and the three-dimensional uh, qualities of the objects on the ground, but also the composition of some of those materials. So whether they're stone or plant life or other types of materials based on the wavelength of life that's uh, bounced back to that camera. And so this is an example of an area in the UK that was mapped out using LIDAR technology. So just to give you a sense of the type of resolution that you can get using LIDAR, um, as this zooms in, you'll, you'll see it's pretty amazing the level of resolution that you can get. And again, I apologize for the lagginess, but you can see there, like you can see every detail on the faces of the buildings. You can almost see individual leaves on the trees all the cars down on the street level. Um, so you get a really intense level of um, detail from uh, LIDAR technology. And this is, this is what's really um, being used now in, in situations where you need more highly detailed three-dimensional models of the landscape. <laughs> Scott, is that something you could import those models? You can import that into like a 3ds max or a sketchup type platform you can and so the way that this is collected is as a point cloud so essentially that you have millions or billions of these points that are recorded and it creates uh, what's known as a point cloud so there are different points that have information about um, how high off the ground they are what type of material they might be and then uh, 3ds max has a built-in system for converting those point clouds into solid models of geometry um, and as do other software as well. So it's basically this three-step process of collecting the LIDAR information, um, creating that point cloud and then, and then converting that point cloud into solid geometry. And so that's how models like this are created. Where do you get that kind of data if you wanted to do that yourself? 
Uh, you can actually, so you can find it on um, open data websites, which we'll, we'll be talking about in a moment. Um, or you can just do a Google search for LIDAR data for a specific geography or region and see what's available. And a lot, most of it is, is freely available that you can just download off the web. Okay, cool. There's a really good website called National Geospatial Data Gateway. If you just type in those words, um, there's like, it's more like watersheds and roads and kind of, but they have LIDAR data sets and ev uh, elevation data sets and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that if I'm, if I remember correctly, that site is managed by the USGS. And yeah, that's USGS. Yeah. And so I, I actually have a series of links um, that I'll share towards the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, where some of this data is available, or actually it might be uh, the next lecture. But um, but anyway, all of this remote data that we collect is um, most usefully applied in the environment of uh, GIS or geographic information systems. And um, GIS has really uh, pushed landscape ecology to new um, to new depths and new levels of understanding that just weren't there before because we now have the opportunity to map and uh, understand and analyze these large scale patterns and relationships that just were not visible to the human eye before. And that just took a lot more work to understand. And we have a much better uh, methodology now for understanding and analyzing those landscapes. And we're gonna be talking about that uh, in more detail uh, in later lectures. One of the best sources for environmental GIS data is the various open data portals, such as this one from the EPA. And you can actually just do a Google search for um, blank, blank open data. So if you're looking for open data about Denver, you can search for Denver open data, or you can look for um, US Forest Service open data or um, Bureau of Land Management open data. And open data typically refers to geospatial data that's freely available to the public that you can download for free and utilize in uh, GIS applications. So of course, one of the most popular kinds of information that we use is visible light imagery or ortho photos. And these are just aerial photos of the ground. This is essentially the same technology that Carl Troll was using back in the day. Uh, of course, it, it, resolution has gotten better and better over the decades so that now we have um, upwards of um, some of the best aerial photos now are six inch resolution, meaning that every pixel represents a six inch by six inch square on the ground. So that's a pretty high level of resolution. Um, but visible light imagery is not the only type of data that we can collect. There are also other um, wavelengths of light that we can collect that tells us, that gives us information about the materiality of what we're seeing on the ground. Um, and this is referred to as multispectral imagery. Um, so here we see some examples of the um, wavelength light signature of different types of materiality. So you can see like healthy grass versus dried yellow grass, fir trees, walnut tree canopy, Every different types, type of plant uh, species has its own specific uh, signature of um, in this multispectral imagery analysis. And by analyzing that, you can tell exactly what types of plants are on the ground. It's used a lot right now in agriculture to um, understand land, larger land areas and the efficiency of agriculture. So here we see examples of this is a multispectral image showing unmowed pasture in reds and yellows. On the right, we have mowed pasture in the greens. Um, there's some drying corn down there towards the bottom. It's used to analyze uh, irrigation patterns in agriculture. So in this case, the greens show well irrigated areas. The reds and yellows show areas that are stressed. And again, this is in information that's collected from the plants themselves just based on the wavelengths of light that they're uh, reflecting back. And so plants are under stress, reflect back a different wavelength of light than plants are healthy and that have plenty of, um, plenty of uh, moisture in the soil. 
And so farmers can use this to pinpoint spots in their land where they might need um, better irrigation. So it's really been helpful in all sorts of different types of um, pursuits. And here we see an example, again, a multispectral imagery. Uh, so on the top, this is an infrared uh, aerial image showing a portion of the Chesapeake Bay. And when we see the image with the naked eye, it just looks like different shades of red and pink. But when you analyze the specific wavelengths, you can actually break down the things like bare soil, grass and shrubs, mangroves, uh, sorry, not Chesapeake Bay, this must be down in the Everglades if there's mangroves, um, open water, reeds and sedges, swamp forests. So you can get a much more detailed view of the different types of landscapes within that photo just based on uh, their wavelength signature. And it doesn't just stop with multispectral, there's also hyperspectral and ultraspectral. So um, the hyper and ultra refer to how many bands of light you can break down uh, those wavelengths into. So the smaller the slices you can get, the more detailed the information you can get. And I see it's 1044 right now. So we will stop there. We'll pick up with this next Tuesday uh, and we'll finish this, finish out this portion of the lecture and then move on to the new material. Um, in the meantime, Thursday, again, come to the table, make sure you attend the uh, virtual symposium and uh, assignment one is posted to Canvas with the uh, connection information and what you need to do for that assignment, which is due next Tuesday. So um, that's it from me for this week. Have fun at the symposium on Thursday and have a good weekend and I will see you all next Tuesday. Thank you, Scott. Thank, Thank you. Scott. Have a good one. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. See ya. Thank you.